My name is Steve Clapham. I'm here to talk about accounting red flags. So to tell you a little bit about myself, my background is I was on the sell side for uh, some years. I moved to the buy side. I was a partner head of research at two multi-billion hedge funds. So I've had a lot of experience in financial analysis. I'm much older than I look. And um, I, about four years ago, I set up a training business. And so let me just tell you a bit about what we do because we do a lot of, we have a lot of free resources for investors. So if you're a keen investor, we've got this investor content hub on our website behind balancesheet.com and it has loads and loads of free resources. So we've got uh, a whole load of blogs. We've got lots of fund letters. We've got a library with about 1500 articles, various aspects of investing. And we've got our top 20. So we've got the top 20 podcasts. We've got the top 20 newsletters. We've got top 20 books. And the books, what we've done, I've not tried to say these are the 20 best books on investing. What I've done is I've said, look, if I were starting out, here are the first 20 books I think everybody should read in order to become a better investor. And you can see that in the top 20 podcasts, the we start with our own podcast, the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast, and that has been incredibly popular. We started in August and we've had some really amazing guests. I mean, people have been incredibly kind and generous. You've got Quinton Price there, the not quite trillion dollar man. He was responsible for nearly a trillion dollars of, of assets at BlackRock. Um, the last one um, we did was we recorded a uh, podcast with um, um, Dan McCrum, who wrote the book Money Men, and he was the FT journalist that exposed the war card fraud. So we also have a YouTube channel where there are lots and lots of videos with helpful guidance on investing tips, also the accounting red flags that I'm going to talk about just now more red flags there than we've got here. And we also have a newsletter. The newsletter behind the balance sheet is free and um, it's been pretty popular. We've had a whole range of articles. I started this in the end of March, beginning of April of this year. So we've done more than one a week actually, um, but we're doing them at about a weekly pace. And you know, why not sign up? It's not, it doesn't cost you anything. What does cost you something is we do online courses and um, we've got a range of different courses on the website, including how to read a balance sheet. So if you're trying to understand financial statements, it's not, it's very technical. It's not a very easy thing to understand. And so what we've done is we've done a walkthrough of, of a, a company accounts. So if you enjoy this presentation, you might also like to look at my book, The Smart Money Method, How to Pick Stocks Like a Hedge Fund Pro. Been, it's an Amazon number one investing bestseller. It's been super popular and, uh, you know, I'm told it's pretty good. So, and if you want to get hold of me, I'm at info at behind the balance sheet.com or you can follow me on Twitter at Steve Clapham. And the website, as I said, is behind the balance sheet.com. So let's just get into this issue of accounting red flags. All of these companies are UK companies that have suffered, if not entire zeros, like patisserie holdings, suffered massive losses because of accounting scandals. And in every single one of these cases, so, you know, Mighty, for example, still quoted, but it, it's a shadow of its former share price. All of these companies, you could have spotted that there was a problem ahead simply by reading the financial statements. Nobody that was caught in any of these should be surprised because they clearly haven't done the work. And people ask me, why are there so many frauds? And I don't know the answer to that. Often the people involved are really, really clever and sometimes go to extraordinary lengths to disguise the fraud. 
This is Dan McCrum and his book, Money Man, which is coming out next week as I'm recording this. And I recorded our latest podcast, number 11, with him yesterday in my studio upstairs from my office here. And that fraud, Dan spent six years trying to uncover it. Sometimes people are incredibly ingenious. And in the case of Wirecard, they went to incredible lengths to disguise the fact that, they're, that they were a fraud. So, but there, even with Wirecard, where they went to these amazing lengths, you could have avoided the getting caught in a zero simply by looking at the accounts, looking at the financial statements. The reason is that everybody, if you do a fraud, you always leave a trail. And there are some quite simple tools which you can use to detect that trail. And these tools are important because it's not just frauds that leave a trail, the tools help you avoid mistakes because they detect weakening businesses as well as frauds. It's not just about fraud. So this is an essential part of an investor's armory. And what are these tools? Well, I'm gonna to talk to you about six. There are others on my YouTube channel, but these half a dozen are the best tools to use and the most popular and the easiest ones to use. First one is to read the audit report and I'll talk in a minute about various other things you can look at in the audit report that will hint at potential problems ahead. The second, and it's a quite common thing, is working capital analysis. So working capital analysis is looking at the levels of stocks, debtors, and creditors, and understanding if there's something funny about them. Free cash flow conversion, how well you convert your earnings into cash. Frauds don't. And companies which don't generate cash, generally speaking, are bad investments, so they're worth avoiding. Margin comparison, comparing your margins with the peers is a really good way of detecting if something's not quite right. And I'll talk also about related party transactions and interest rates, using interest rates. Now, this suite of tools, I mean, I said it requires some analytical skill. It's, honestly, it's pretty simple to learn and acquire. But the most important thing is, apart from these checks I'm going to tell you, is use your common sense. Investing should be pretty simple. If something doesn't make sense, if it doesn't ring true, avoid it. There's lots of stocks to buy. Don't get involved with something that doesn't seem quite right. So the first tool is to read the audit report. And this is Thomas Cook. And you know, all of you know it went bust, right? So if you'd read the Thomas Cook audit report, you would have seen this paragraph. Material uncertainty related to going concern. We draw attention to note one in the financial statements, which indicates that the outcome of the strategic review and the associated conditions in the new financing arrangement is uncertain. That sounds a bit complicated, but you know, these events or conditions indicate that material uncertainty exists. When you see the word material, accountants, when they say material, it means it's significant. And when they say in the next sentence, this may cast significant doubt on the company's ability to continue as a going concern. Never mind investment in this company. I wouldn't have booked a holiday with them if I'd read this. I mean, the auditor is saying they may not be around. Well, you wouldn't even want to book a holiday. What's amazing to me is that nobody reads this and they carried on in business. Other things to think about, the auditor's identity. I mean, the big four auditors, People get a certain amount of comfort from the fact that a company is audited by the big four. And if it's not audited by the big four, or perhaps if it's a smaller company by big six in the UK, then you do want to pay attention because if it's audited by some backstreet operator, then that is a massive red flag and you want to avoid this company. But even the big four, Jim Chanos, the longest serving short seller, the man who made his reputation shorting Enron, 20 odd years ago, he says, behind every great fraud, there's a big audit firm. So you can't rely on the big audit firm protecting you. I'm also going to talk about auditor location, report issues, and fees. So in the past, 
if you were audited by a UK regional office of the big four, you were more likely to get away with a fraud than if you were audited in London. All the big four have introduced technical centers of excellence in London. And if you're in the regions, you may have to speak to London in order to get clearance for certain treatments. So this isn't as big an issue as it was, but it's still an issue, still a potential risk. And in the audit report, you need to read it. You need to read the comments they make because the debates with management on assumptions tells you a lot. The Karelian auditors receive a lot of criticism. I love that. I love that slogan, by the way, making tomorrow a better place. What does that mean? What has it got to do with construction? That should be a red flag. But in that, in that um, audit report, they tell you the recognition of contract revenue margin related receivables and liabilities is a risk. It is an issue. And when you see that, you say, well, hang on a second, what does that mean? And if you don't know what it means, then maybe you should think about, well, am I really taking more of a risk investing in this than I possibly should? The audit fee. I do a lot of detail checks in the audit fee. I check the fee versus history, the fee versus sales, it's fees versus history and sales versus the peers. And I particularly check the non-audit fees. If you've got a very high non-audit fee relative to the audit fee, that's usually an indication that the auditor's independence is not all you might want. It doesn't mean to say that it's a fraud. It doesn't mean to say there's any shenanigans, but it creates a risk. And you can see here that the vast majority of companies, so there's 1,700 companies in, the, in Europe, 1,500 companies in the US, the vast majority of companies, well over half, 60%, are of less than 20% of the audit fee is non-audit. And even under 30% is, is, I don't know, 70 odd percent. If you've got more non-audit fees than audit fees, that's very unusual and should just ring a warning bell in your mind. So that's the audit fee. I'm gonna talk about working capital ratios now and I'm going to use the example of Kellogg's. And what you want to look at here is the fact that I've done a quarterly analysis here and the quarterly analysis is quite noisy. But when I look at the annual analysis, you can see the trend is very clear. And the trend for Kellogg's receivable days was very strongly up in this period. Notice that I've taken a 15 year trend. And I, that allows me to zoom out and look at the trend from a distance. And that's very, very important skill, very important tool. I can do that very easily because I use a system that drops this number out in, you know, into a, a spreadsheet. Obviously, if you're a private investor, you don't have that tool. It's not not as easy, but there are websites around that you can check that. And obviously I've also chopped off the scale on the, on the Y axis, just to clarify how the, tr the trend is moving. Um, that's debtors. This is inventory. So this is patisserie Valerie. And you can see that inventory days versus sales doesn't look that big a number, but when you look at it versus cost of sales, and this is when I'm looking at the historical trend, I prefer to look at inventory days versus cost of sales because I think it's a more meaningful number. And you can see here, the trend is very clearly up, but even at the start, it was 50 days. At the end, it's 90 days. Patisserie Valerie, Patisserie Holdings was selling cake, right? That 90 days is way, way too long. I thought, well, perhaps there's something funny about it because most of the inventory was in raw materials and consumables. And consumables, that's a funny phrase. So I thought I better check because maybe there's something about bakery. You can see that there was 6 million of inventory on 114 million of revenue. So what I do then is I check this against a similar company. And it's very easy to do that in the UK because everybody's got to file accounts with companies house. So this is the accounts of Paul UK, very similar business to Patisserie Valerie. Uh, I mean, the product's very similar. It's got 35 million of turn turnover, so one third of the turnover. So Patisserie Valerie, three times the turnover, but look at the stocks, quarter of a million. So Patisserie Valerie had 20 times the stock for three times the turn turnover. That should ring 
huge alarm bells. And that, was, that inventory was not real. So, you know, but I don't know why the auditor didn't spot that, but I spotted it very, very quickly. Cash or earnings? You'll all be familiar with this. I've used a chart of Carillion. And what I've done is I've done this at the EBIT levels. I've compared the EBIT with cash from operations. So I'm looking at this before tax. And you can see there's a massive, massive disconnect. So the earnings keep going up and the cash flow disappears. This is the classic warning signal. Always look at how much cash the business is generating. Margin comparisons. This is one of my favorite, favorite tools. Again, I've shown patisserie Valerie. The, the ticker for patisserie Valerie, patisserie holdings, it was a, its official title. The ticker was cake. So in all these charts, the red line is patisserie holdings, ticker cake. And I've compared it here with three other companies in its peer group. And you can see that I'm doing the comparison at the EBIT margin level, because that is the most relevant level to use. Some people will look at gross margin. That isn't a good idea because there's no consistency in the basis. Some people use EBITDA, but you're ignoring depreciation. And depreciation is a massive cost to many businesses. So the best thing to do is look at the EBIT margin. And again, this is easy for me to do because I've got the tools. <laughs> it's less easy to do if you're a private investor, but you could do this for two years quite easily looking at four sets of accounts. It would only take you five minutes, honestly. Re download the accounts from company's house. You're looking at the P&L. You're looking at the operating profit over turnover. You're looking at eight, eight numbers per year for two years. So 16 numbers. It, it's easy to do. Um, obviously, I've got a trend here, but the most important thing that you look at here is you say, well, hang on a second. Why is Patisserie Holdings making twice the margins of its peers? The nearest one is Fulham Shore, 12%. Restaurant Group, 8 9%. JD Weatherspoon, 8%. So Patisserie Holdings, and its margins are going up. And the rest of them, they're going down or flatlining. And you ask, well, why is that? And what you've got to have is you've got to have a good reason. You've got to understand why. And if you then say, well, that looks funny. I'm going to do some further work on it. You might say, well, what, what, maybe there's some better examples. And you say, well, what's producer audience do? Is it like a cafe? So let's look at Starbucks and Costa Coffee, two similar businesses. And you can see that producer holdings is declaring almost as much margin as Starbucks. Now, you don't need to be a sophisticated hedge fund analyst to work out that producer holdings, a tiny company which sells all of its product in the restaurant couldn't in a million years make the margin of Starbucks, which is selling coffee, not perishable cakes. Coffee's got a very high gross margin. It's selling coffee to take away. So Starbucks would have a much lower cost for labor, a much lower cost for property. What are the two largest cost elements other than the, other than the food? Labor, 35 to 40% of, of sales. Rent, 10 to 12% of sales. So nearly half, half of sales, not even half of cost, half of sales is tied up in those two elements, which would be bound to be much higher for patisserie holdings. And the, the margins are, are higher than Costa by a long chalk, in spite of the fact that Costa coffee margins are before the allocation within Whitbread of the headquarter costs which at the time were running at 35 million per annum or 1.1% of revenues. So the cost of margins would actually be one point lower. And cost is a much, much, much bigger business than Pedestrian Holdings. And Pedestrian Holdings had all the costs of being a public company, which are significant for a company with 115 million of turnover. Right? So this, this, this just couldn't possibly happen. 
And if you then drilled further into this, you would say, well, let's have a look at some unquoted peers. And what I've done here is I compared the margins of these three holdings with four random restaurant chains in the UK. And you can see that, you know, Cafe Nero, Paul UK, Cafe Contrato are making losses or no money at all. But look at Cafe Nero. Its margins have gone from 10%, just under 10%, to below 5%. They've halved in the period where patisserie holdings margins have gone up. Cafe Nero, if you ever walked past a Cafe Nero and a patisserie holdings, I can guarantee you the Cafe Nero would be busier. It's also got a takeaway element. There's no way that patisserie holdings could be making higher margins. Just no way, just from walking down the street. So this is something that any private investor could have and should have spotted. Related parties, it's very easy to make a mistake if you don't read the related parties note. This is Fundsmith. You can see that the if you just look at the profit attributable to the member of the largest entitlement, you'd have assumed that Terry Smith was making 30 million a year. But if you'd looked at the PL, you'd have said, well, hang on a second, there's a 40 million jump in those administrative expenses, they've gone from 139 to 180 million. Why is that? Because fund management's a fairly fixed cost business. And if you then dug into this, you'd have found that there was a related party transaction. And during the year, the LLP was charged 156 million by Fundsmith Investment Services Limited. And if you did a bit of detection work, you'd have worked out that that was a Mauritius company that was owned by Terry Smith. So Terry Smith took home 156 million, not the 30 million. So always read the related parties note up front. And if there are a lot of significant related party transactions, it may be something that you don't want to pursue too closely. Lots of examples of that. This is Samsonite. If you look at Samsonite accounts, huge swathes of related party transactions. Finally, I just want to turn quickly to debt and interest rates. You want to be very careful of indebted companies, especially those with growing debt and especially those with high interest charges. It may, this may change if we're in an inflationary environment. Companies with a manageable amount of debt, you may benefit from that because inflation will decrease the, the value of that debt in real terms. But um, what you do need to do is you need to make sure that the debt at the year end is not very lowly stated. So what I did here is I checked the debt at year end and quarterly, and the, the year end for Thomas Cook was a seasonal low. So often subject to window dressing. So you can easily see this by comparing the value of the debt at year end with the interest charge. And here's, I mean, this is so simple. So you can see that at the end of 2018, Thomas Cook had 389 million of debt. And you can see on the right-hand side, that the finance income of cost, the total net interest was 150 million. If you take out the separately disclosed costs, which are things like refinancing costs and so on, the underlying interest was 124 million. So you had debt which started the year at the net debt, started the year at 40, ended the year at under 400, and you're paying 120 million. That's like 30% on the closing balance, but the average debt in the year was 200 million and you paid 120 million in interest. That is obviously, obviously that should have told you that there was something wrong. So that's all I want to, to talk about today. I hope that you've, I've left you with a strong impression that is really important to read the financial statements, that these accounting tools are there to help you, to keep you out of trouble. So remember, read the audit report, make sure that you understand if there's any issues, check the margins, very important, check the cash conversion, check also the working capital ratios, that they don't look daft and make sure there's nothing funny about the debt and make sure there's not any huge related party transactions. My name's Steve Clapham. Thank you very much for listening. It's been great to have the opportunity to talk to you.